Well, hey, good morning, everyone. We're almost there once again. And Nalini, I think you're muted. I am muted. Thank you for that reminder, Rich. I too was just welcoming people and saying good morning. As you enter into this area here, once again, please familiarize yourself with that left toolbar. You'll see some icons there that say lobby, stage, sessions, and expo. We're going to be on the stage first. That's right. Rich is showing you this direction there. But we'll be giving you more instructions as we continue on here. Absolutely. And we got past a few hiccups uh, yesterday with uh, the screen share at the beginning. And then I know a few people had some foibles in trying to get around to table conversations, but hopefully uh, we'll stay patient and we'll get this. Uh, God is at work and, uh, and we're trying to jump on board. Amen. And we're so glad for, for those that are just joining us today, if you weren't here yesterday, just wanted to give you a, a shout out and a special welcome. Thank you for making that time today. Absolutely. Another reminder to check out different parts of the, the conference, not right now, but a little later, if you uh, click onto sessions, join a session, click onto expo, see some of the booths that are available. And if you visit a few of them, you'll be entered into a drawing to win David Fitch's book signed copy of David Fitch's book. Yeah. <laughs> We've got a full day today. Good day. <laughs> well, folks, we'll just be, we'll be starting here officially in just a little bit. Once again, it would be great to hear where people are coming from. Oh, midnight 30, Saturday here, says Jenny in the chat. <laughs> Who's joining us from Papua New Guinea. That's awesome. Good morning from BC, West Michigan. Oh, good stuff. Wonderful. Well, it's 1030 Eastern, so we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome, everyone, to day two of the Global Mission Summit 2021. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, you can see the slide on the screen with a number of people registered for this conference. We have 562 registrants. We are excited and grateful that you've joined us. Now we had some wonderful learning and conversations yesterday and we've got a great day ahead of us. Now, for those of you who are able to join us yesterday, you waited patiently with us as we worked out some technical glitches. So thank you for that. And just a reminder, uh, David Fitch's plenary session from yesterday has been uploaded to the Expo section, so you can access it from there. And if you do have any trouble today, please put your question or concern in the event chat, and one of our team members on tech support will respond. Now we've got this morning session, some optional opportunities to connect over lunch, or maybe it will be coffee, tea time, depending on where you're located. And then later today, we're gonna to have our special breakout sessions. And all of this, in addition to more speakers, storytellers, and engaging table conversations. But first, let's open our time in prayer together. And just because we're digitally separated, this doesn't mean that we can't pray together. That's right, absolutely. So I have in front of me, and hopefully you can see this okay, it might be a little bit difficult, but it's a card set and it's called an examine. An examine is kind of a form of guided prayer and it's cool, it sort of, it starts out with gratitude and then you sort of go through their seven cards and it invites you to reflect, to call out where you want to see more of God in your life, expressing our hopes and then it always comes back to gratitude again. <laughs> so uh, hopefully all those things will be part of our prayers all day today, but we wanna start by inviting you to just put two things in the stage chat that's on the right side of your screen. Would you put in one word or phrase, preferably a word of gratitude to God? What are you thanking God for this morning? Put that word in the stage chat section, but then also put in a word of hope. What are you hoping for today? And maybe that word is specific to our time together. Maybe it's beyond this conference where you'd like to see a little more of God present where you are, wherever you are in the world. 
Yeah, and as you put that in the stage chat section, we're going to come back to those prayers in a later session. But as you continue to put down these words of gratitude and words of hope, let's go to God together in prayer. Yes. So God, we are so grateful for your goodness, your love, the opportunity we have right now together to attend to these things. You make glad our hearts. And we're aware, sometimes all too aware, of what isn't right. Lord, we have known and experienced, especially in this last year, so much of what is not right with the world, the pain and suffering that is all too real. We acknowledge our deep need of you. In the same way, we know our own hearts have often been far from you. We confess that we have been culpable shalom breakers. And more than that, as we gather in this conference to celebrate your mission, we know we have often ignored your call and invitation to join you on mission. We lament our own shortcomings and sin. We call on your mercy, trusting that you restore and make things new. So Lord, focus us again upon you, your project of new creation. Help us to hear your invitation. And again, we thank you for the opportunity and grace to be your people, even today, right here, right now. Amen. Amen. All right, so now it is our great pleasure at this time to welcome this morning's speaker, Rachel Beveridge. And Rachel serves with Resonate as the co Cohort Program Coordinator. And Cohort is a year-long missional experience immersing young adults in cross-cultural service and collaboration at the grassroots level. Rachel is passionate about helping young adults discover God's intense love for this world, as you'll see, understand the deep injustices present in their communities and live out of their own unique vocation. Rachel is joining us from Guatemala where she lives with her husband, Isra. So welcome, Rachel. Good morning, everyone. I'm Rachel Beveridge, and I'm here in Guatemala City. I have the privilege of spending my days walking alongside young adults as they discover the breadth of God's love and presence in the world and the very real invitation to be a part of what God is doing. I do this in Central America, coordinating Resonate's collaborative initiative called Cohort Central America, which is an opportunity for young adults from all over the Americas to serve and grow in community. In Spanish, the cohort is called Caminantes. It is in a literal translation. A camino is a path, a road, or way. And Caminantes could be loosely translated as wayfarers, or those that walk, or those that journey. And even alludes to being people of the way, as Jesus' followers were known. One of the inspirations for naming our program Caminantes is a poem in Spanish by Antonio Machado. It says, Caminante no hay camino, se hace camino al andar. And I don't really like any of the English translations of this phrase in the poem, but it would be something like, there's no path for the journeyer. The path is made as you walk. The name is a less triumphalistic name than you might imagine for an intercultural missions program. It's an invitation to a lifelong journey, a journey of joining ourselves to God's purposes in any given place, in any given time. It implies uncertainty perhaps not knowing all the answers or exactly where the road will go. And it is plural, the Camino is forged collectively. Caminantes is also the term used in Spanish to describe the two followers of Jesus in the Luke 24 passage. Two followers of Jesus who despite months or perhaps years of time with Jesus didn't understand what he was doing and decided to walk home. The Caminantes de Emmaus, the followers of Jesus on the road to Emmaus. Over the days of this conference, we're exploring the themes of walking, asking, listening, and reimagining. This morning, let's explore more what it means to ask. Today, we are focusing on the part of the passage where Jesus finds these two followers, these two caminantes. They're walking home, and he asks them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? So remember for a second the context of this walk and this question. These followers of Jesus were walking home just a few days after Jesus' crucifixion. They didn't stay with the disciples or the other followers of Jesus, but decided that it was over. They were done, and it was time to go home, despite the report that Jesus was alive. So Jesus shows up, and he's present with them. 
And it's surprising that Jesus joins these caminantes, these followers. I would have guessed that he probably would have prioritized the 11 disciples and the women who had gone to the tomb. I would probably have guessed that these two followers who clearly didn't understand his life, his death, or his kingdom probably wouldn't have been a high priority for Jesus. But they were, and he walks along with them, and he is present with them. But Jesus goes beyond mere presence, or perhaps he shows us what real presence is. He asks them what they're talking about. They tell him that he must be the only one who hasn't read the headlines, who hasn't heard all the things that have been going on, and he asks them, what things? These were followers of Jesus who were going home. It doesn't take that much emotional intelligence to infer that they were probably feeling dejected, hopeless, perhaps even deceived. But instead of just assuming that this is how they were feeling, Jesus gives them the opportunity, not just once, but twice, to express what they were talking about, what they were experiencing. By doing this, Jesus demonstrates attention, or what is known in psychology as attunement. He focuses on them and what they're experiencing. Attunement shows authentic care and concern. Attunement isn't actually about solving. It isn't about advice or answers, but it's about feeling comforted, accompanied in what we are experiencing. Luke, the author of this passage, says that they had sadness written across their faces. This is key because it tells us not just the words being spoken, but what the facial expressions and maybe the body language were also saying. Jesus not only attunes to what they are feeling, he gives them a chance to express how they experienced it and interpreted the events of the last several days. By allowing them to speak for themselves, he hear their, hears their version of the events. This allows him to engage them where they truly are instead of where he might assume they are. This is the opposite of that frustrating experience that I'm sure we've all had in which we're telling someone about something and we just want them to listen to us. And before we can even finish, they're already giving us advice and maybe even advice that isn't really about the real concern or question at hand. So today, do we, the church, ask or do we just assume? And if we do ask, are we really open to the answers? Because of the work that I do, the, I have the privilege of seeing the church through the eyes of younger adults who are a little bit younger than me. I hope I'm still also a young adult. One of my personal frustrations with the church because of the last few years of doing this type of work is that generalizing, the church doesn't ask questions that show authentic interest to the young adults in their own congregations, let alone to people outside. Young adults spend a year with us in the cohort and the very, very common experience is that when they return home, excited to share what they have learned and done with people from their church, they frequently receive little attention. Sometimes they're literally asked no real questions, no questions about their experience, about how they experience God in a different context, about the challenges, about how they're doing with the transition home. Recently, one of our cohort alumni who spent the year working in a fantastic Christian organization that works with very vulnerable children, returned home to North America to have her church say to her, well, we didn't really support what you were doing because you are an unmarried woman and you weren't specifically planting reformed churches. This is perhaps one of the more extreme examples, but almost all of the young adults that go through the cohort experience some version of apathy or even rejection. And this isn't just true of young adults who venture abroad, but also of young adults who have had the opportunity to speak with who are just returning home from college or who have never even gone anywhere, but begin to feel that the church isn't it really interested in getting to know them, their gifts, or the issues and the people that they care about? Recently, I had the privilege of listening to some young adults from the CRC describe some of the things that they love about the CRC, but also some of their struggles within the CRC. One comment from a young man in the U.S. who is currently in leadership in his local CRC church really stuck out to me. Paraphrasing, he said, there's a lot of talk about why young adults are leaving the church but most of it is in incorrect hypotheses made by people who aren't even the ones asking us why we're leaving. The take of many young adults, including this young man, is that there's a lot of assumptions and incorrect hypotheses out there, and that the church really needs to be taking the time to talk directly to these young adults, not trying to convince them to stay, but to really understand why they're leaving. And here's the catch. Church young adults may experience hurt over not feeling understood or pursued for more authentic connection or opportunities within the church. But from my conversations with them, I don't think that's ultimately why many choose to leave. 
Many choose to leave the church because they feel that the church is not only incapable of authentically caring and engaging them, but more importantly, they see the church as incapable of authentically caring for engaging the people that these young adults care about. I recently heard a young adult say something along the lines of, I get the impression that the church was just kidding when they taught us that for God so loved the world and that we are called to do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. It seems like the church is now saying that that doesn't really apply to the people we know and care about. I want to briefly explore the statement by Jesus in Acts that we are also uh, using during this conference. Acts 1.8 says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Before engaging what witness in Judea means, which is part of our focus for today, I want to briefly take a look at what comes right before this statement from Jesus. Luke tells us at the beginning of Acts 1 that Jesus appeared to the apostles on multiple occasions over a period of 40 days after the resurrection. And in verse 6, these apostles asked Jesus, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? And verse 7 and 8 are his response. Jesus replies, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. I want to explore both the question that the apostles asked and the first part of Jesus' response, because I think they can both be an encouragement to us. The apostles' question shows us that they still don't get it. From our lens, we may even go too far as to, as to say that it's a really stupid question. When we look at the Old Testament prophecies and then Jesus' own declarations about his death and his kingdom, it seems foolish to us that the people closest to Jesus would still be asking about political liberation in which he would overthrow the Romans and bring independence to Israel. Jesus responds to this foolish question, not with rebukes or theology lecture, but by saying, only God the Father knows. And then he says, you will have the Holy Spirit power, and you will be witnesses in all these places. Jesus embraces the foolish question and responds with a very different sort of answer than they were expecting. Perhaps if we begin asking questions, even foolish questions, we will also get some different sorts of answers than we were expecting. Today, our focus is on Judea. What does it look like to be witnesses in Judea? Judea, if you look at your biblical geography, is a large area where most of Jesus' ministry took place. Jerusalem, for example, is in Judea. So for our application, we were talking about people, places, cultures, and spaces that are not necessarily our home base, where we're most comfortable, but they're close by. Instead of assuming that we have all the answers and we know what everyone in this space needs, in Judea needs, what would it look like for the church to be more curious, to ask more questions, even if they were foolish questions? The young adults that I have the privilege of working with are not afraid of the questions and challenges around them. Many truly believe that we have to take Jesus and the Old Testament prophets very seriously, and they begin to engage and show God's love to the people around them and assume that the church will follow suit. They know people that the traditional church hasn't been willing to engage, and they care about the issues that affect these people. This leads them to get involved in anti-racism work, pursue peacemaking and nonviolence, combat childhood sexual abuse and human trafficking, but look for systemic solutions to homelessness, education policies that help second language learners, and the list goes on. And if you're listening to this list, and honestly, it sounds like issues that are a part of a political agenda that you don't share, I would humbly ask you to reach out to one young adult from your church who is involved in one of these types of initiatives and just ask them about it. Ask them why they care about the issue, and more importantly, the people behind the issue. If we just read the news, or worse, our own Facebook timeline, I don't think we'll really get a pulse on the real challenges that people in our communities are facing around the real questions that they are asking. Recently, an important missiologist and theologian from Latin America, Rene Padilla, passed away. As I was reading through different articles and pieces written about him after his death, I noticed that in several places, Rene was cited as saying something to the effect that his university and graduate studies at Wheaton College in the U.S. 
had shaped him significantly and he was grateful. But then when he returned to Latin America afterwards, he was left feeling like the answers he was given at Wheaton were not applicable to the pressing questions in Latin America. As a recent Christianity Today article said, the question for Padilla was not whether the gospel spoke to the challenging Latin American context, but how. As Christians, we are sure that the gospel can speak today, but in order for it to speak powerfully, hopefully, and prophetically to our context, we actually have to understand our context. If the issues that I mentioned earlier, sex trafficking, homelessness, etc., are your issues, and you're tempted to think that the invitation to ask and engage the questions and challenges in our context is only for other people, I'd ask you to think again. True contextualization requires that all of us ask, re-ask, and be willing to listen. By asking and then listening with attunement, we may realize that what we thought were the issues for the people around us aren't really. So where do we start as we engage the people of Judea, those that aren't that far or that different, but those that we aren't the most comfortable with either? Maybe it's just with the young adults that have left our church. What would it look like to engage them with real attunement? Maybe it's with the city council of our city. What are the major, cha major challenges that they've identified? Maybe it's with the leadership or the membership members of a church on the same block as our church, a church that maybe we've been ignoring or even in rivalry with. Maybe it's with people without homes that use our church's front steps as shelter when it rains. The gospel has power, but only if we let it truly shine light into the real issues that people are facing. I have the privilege of watching young adults engage their local churches. While many of these experiences leave a lot to be desired, others give me hope. Recently, a cohort alumna, Brenda, began a ministry alongside other women in El Salvador to work with women, especially those who have, been ex who have experienced abuse within the church. And they've been successful in pulling several churches into this work. One of our earliest cohort graduates, Nathan, took everything he learned as a part of in the as a part of his experience in the cohort of Caminantes in Honduras, and recently launched Cohort Detroit, another opportunity for young adults and local organizations. He and others from the local communities in which they're working and from Resonate have successfully worked with several churches in Michigan to get this program up and running. And a friend of mine here in Guatemala, a young woman in her 20s, just last week was telling me about how she finally got her reticent church on board to start a medical clinic in the church building, providing medical care to people from communities around the church that have had difficulty accessing this type of adequate medical attention. None of these or the dozens of other stories that I could tell you were easy. They require that each person or group of people look around them and ask difficult questions, maybe even foolish questions. Then came the onboarding of their local churches, which was also difficult, but they were persistent and patient. Today, the invitation is for all of us to become caminantes, trusting that by living under the principles of the kingdom of God, that God will guide us forward as we humbly engage the questions and challenges around us. Caminante no hay camino. Se hace camino al andar. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you, Rachel. So glad that that worked. So good to hear. Thank you for that call to be Comenantes. None of us exempt from this opportunity to ask tough questions, to wonder and engage and tune in to our Judea. So we're going to welcome Rachel back on the stage in just a couple of moments. But again, we have the opportunity to welcome three storytellers to help us imagine mission in Judea. So as you listen, again, please put questions for our storytellers and for Rachel in that uh, stage Q&A section on the right of your screen over there. So not the chat, but the Q&A. And after their presentation, we'll have a chance to interact with your questions. So first up, would you welcome Sebastian Maldonado, Sebastian is raised in Bogota, but based in Toronto. He's a PhD student, a community leader, and a campus minister at York University. He's engaging with 
anti-colonialism, working with black, indigenous, and people of color toward community transformation. Welcome, Sebastian. Oh, just a little hiccup there. We're waiting on uh, Sebastian getting the tech right. So I'm gonna introduce Kurt uh, to you in just a moment. Kurt, uh, Kurt Ridema is also joining us. Kurt is Senior Director of YF Neighborhood, leading Christian community in a diverse, under-resourced part of Kansas City, which is where he's joining us from today. His work involves social entrepreneurship, uh, youth, short-term mission, intentional neighboring, working with immigrants, and much more. Welcome, Kurt. Happy to pinch hit here today <laughs> with Sebastian coming in. Um, okay, so I'm going to begin and I'm going to give you a four-step plan for developing a youth ministry in an under-resourced neighborhood. Number one, find a place to rent in your neighborhood that is centrally located where youth naturally gravitate to. It might cost you a premium, but as we know, it's all about location, location, location. Number two, attract them to your youth groom with cool games, free snacks, and drinks. And this is especially necessary in a neighborhood without a lot of money. Number three, form a youth group that meets for amazing worship and powerful teaching. We all know kids only have an attention span that lasts about as long as a two minute YouTube video, so you've got to make it catchy. Number four, after you've built a strong core of leaders, think about what you can do to bless your neighborhood. Finally, you have kids who are mature enough to think outside of themselves and you can go on mission together. This is advice that's sometimes given. This dear viewer is not what we did. Instead of ending with mission, mission is where we began. We began with these missional questions. What does it look like when heaven comes to our neighborhood? And one of our guiding verses with our kids is to soak in that Revelation 21 verses 1 to 3 imagination of the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven and God dwelling with us and wiping away every tear. And our second question comes from Romans 8 verses 19 to 23. Where is creation groaning for liberation around us? How is it waiting in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed? This is the starting place for mission. So when we asked neighborhood youth these questions in our youth social entrepreneurship program, and they looked around their neighborhood, this is what they said. Number one, kids are bored after school. They, they want to be with their friends, but their parents are working and they don't just trust them to be with just anyone. And one of the kids said it this way, the stupidest things that I've done in my life have been when I've been most bored. And I think we can all relate to it. And number two, they said, empty storefronts make us feel like we live in a ghetto. And I think this quote testifies to the kind of psychological burden of living in blighted urban neighborhoods for kids. They know it has a bad reputation. So these kids decided to address both things at once and turn an empty neighborhood storefront into a cool neighborhood hangout for kids. They knew what other kids wanted, what those kids would be able to pay for, and so they created a menu and a business model based off of this. So that's what they did. For the next 18 months, they found an empty storefront that happened to be owned by the school district who just used it for storage, and our youth said they had a better use for it. They presented a plan and like the persistent widow, we sent nearly weekly emails just bothering school board members and the CEO of the school district until one day they handed high school kids a lease agreement at a staggering cost of $200 a month. So they were recruited volunteers to remodel this space. They raised money to outfit it. The local news featured their grand opening. They created their own jobs. They created a safe space for youth to hang out and have relationships with caring and curious adults. And today it is the place for neighborhood middle school kids to hang out after school. And then last year, just before the pandemic hit, we hired a youth pastor to walk alongside them and they started forming that youth group. Yeah, so we did it all backwards. We didn't have to pay market rent. We didn't have to give out freebies to attract the kids. They didn't have to be mature young Christian leaders before they went out on mission. And I think that's because too often we think that real youth ministry begins once you have that youth group. And I believe it begins when we ask that first question of mission and following Jesus to bring liberation and healing to the pain of the world around us. We began with mission. And in doing so, they were equipped with a deeper understanding of mission. Instead of random acts of kindness, it was a strategic intervention to combat blight and loneliness. 
Instead of sporadic service projects and mission trips once or twice a year, our kids worked hard to create a sustainable business. And instead of putting band-aids on problems that helped for a day, they created a space that addressed systemic social issues. And instead of in, uh, benefiting individual strangers, they engaged on mission that benefited the entire community. Thank you, Kurt. Amazing. And I did see that we had Sebastian on. Um, so uh, we're, we're still working on going back to Toronto. So we are going to go ahead with our third storyteller and keep working on getting Sebastian onto the stage. So uh, our third storyteller, our second storyteller this morning is Sparrow Etter Carlson. And she is joining us from Seattle. We get to go to lots of urban centers where she has spent almost the last two decades creating space for unhoused neighbors, including those who are drug dependent and involved in survival-based prostitution. She's worked with Aurora Commons, the City of Seattle Adult Survivor Collaborative, and the HIV Epidemic Statewide Committee, King County, and the Just Access to Healthcare for Drug Users Committee. So welcome, Sparrow. Mm. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Now, imagine with me a naturalist or field biologist whose job is to pay attention to every living and dying thing within their particular ecosystem. This naturalist is aware of the interconnectedness of all things within their place. She watches, she listens, she tends, she prunes, she sees withering or wilting, she sees growth, she maps and measures the slightest or most magnificent changes over time. And she asks, how is one of the whole impacting the other? She can tell you the names of each and every specimen. Aurora Avenue in Seattle is our ecosystem. And we approach our role in the neighborhood first and foremost, as a naturalist does. We pay attention. So despite the enormity of our citywide homelessness crisis and the fear, anger, inconvenience, and entitlement it invokes in all of us sometimes, we are committed to paying attention to the life and death within our ecosystem. And it is here that we continue to practice daily presence and kinship with the particular people in our neighborhood who are told and treated as though they don't matter. We are committed to being mindful to each person we encounter as an individual so that we may offer contextualized decolonialized, not professionalized community care. For what we've learned in this world of charity that is mostly orchestrated by systemic responses is that people experiencing homelessness are constantly given a negative answer to really the most important personal questions upon which their fullness and flourishing depends. Who am I? What am I? My friend Goldie is one of these precious people. She has received so many false names in her life, from the foster system to the streets, to her prison number, the house mothers who shield their children from her, from her pimp over and over again, told by all of us that she is a pariah and a problem. This is her current story. In Pilgrim at Tinker Creek, Annie Dillard writes of a patient who was blind since birth, but can now see after cataract surgery. There were significant anomalies in their perceptions of space and time. Someone who was trying to learn how to use his new skill would take off one of his boots and throw it out in front of him across the room. He would then try to guess the distance and take a few steps towards it, trying to grab it, but missing it entirely. The new sensations of color and light were dazzling for these people, but at the same time, for many of them, also oppressive. It was the realization of the tremendous size of the world, Dillard suggests, something that had previously conceived of, they had previously conceived of as touchingly manageable. My friend Goldie just moved into her own apartment after 30 years of living on the streets. It is in this home that she finds herself feeling more alone and depressed than ever. 
She tells me she just doesn't know what to do now. She keeps finding herself back out on the streets and says she prays every day that God would take the like out of crack, meth, and the hustle. I ask her to say more, and together we begin unearthing the role of crack and meth in Goldie's life. Because life on the streets is so cruel and unpredictable, typically the only thing that has offered her a sense of orientation is the purpose nature of transactions, buying drugs, exchanging sex, those things that she must engage in to survive along Aurora Avenue. Now that Goldie is off the streets with no sense of orientation, it's kind of like she takes her boot off, throws it across her apartment, and misses it all together. It just doesn't work anymore. Tears roll down her face. New sensations of light and color were dazzling. But the possibility embodied in her apartment, she says, is almost more cruel and oppressive than the streets. Goldie's disorientation cannot be prescribed an answer by professionalized care, for they have to do more with a sense of belonging of counting, of ordering, of mattering. Like Goldie, the particularity of each person, their individual attempts to make meaning and find relief is our dignified Holy Spirit guide as a church. And as each precious person guides us, may we listen to their words and their bodies with a watchful, wholeness-seeking eye, while all the while, weaving together the fragments to create new patterns of belonging. Thank you. Wow. Thanks so much, Sparrow. Again, hearing of real hope in the midst of hard realities. And now we are going to try to welcome Sebastian. We've got him. I'm so encouraged. So welcome, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry for the little technical issue. Um, well, I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to um, to share my story after hearing those stories. Um, and again, as a storyteller, um, I have to start my story telling you that this is a story of a paradigm shift, really. And it is my personal paradigm shift, but also the paradigm shift of uh, the ministry that I am part of. Uh, the story uh, begins with um, with a question, and the question was, uh, what do you learn today? And the story also starts with a theological statement. And, and that theological statement was, uh, to, as a response of what did you learn today, the, the response was that the blood of the lamb has cleansed our transgressions, and now we are forgiven and can be in the presence of God. And, and if you think about it, that is a profound theological statement. Uh, the only problem was that that statement was uh, came out of a 12-year-old black girl that was part of the summer program that I was being part of at the time in the north end of Toronto. Now, I was astonished. I was astonished, to be honest, and not necessarily because I thought she was a great theologian, but rather because I don't know if she knew what she was talking about. At the time, I was a graduate student in philosophy and theology. I was doing my... Um, uh, my studies in, in systematic theology, and I, I didn't know what that meant. I was struggling with that statement, and yet she was so confident talking about it. So I began to ask myself, how that statement, how is that statement relevant in her life? What does that even mean? Just to give you some context, at the time I was also part of a campus ministry that uh, was located at York University in Toronto, which is located at the north end of the city, which happens to be in the in the area of uh, of a neighborhood called Jane and Finch, which is a neighborhood that is seen uh, as the prototypical low income and at risk community in Canada, and uh, probably as many of, of, of uh, as many of you know, uh, campus ministries are usually these spaces where uh, you know Christian community and minist ministers wait for students to come and they mentor them and you know they help in their spiritual growth. And especially as they're away from home or their home church. And, and being there, uh, we realized that as a leadership team, there was something off for us in just waiting for the students to arrive. And, and, and we realized that by being in the neighborhood, experiencing what was happening in the neighborhood, 
there was a bridge that was broken. And if not broken, it was very fragile. And that bridge was the bridge that connected a lot of these young people in the neighborhood, in this low-income neighborhood, to the university. Uh, it, was an, it was a bridge that uh, many didn't cross. I'm talking about a neighborhood that is 94% of people uh, that self-identified as, as visible minorities, most of them being black and brown people. Most of them uh, are the first ones who are going to university in their case, and, and many of them don't even make it out of high school. They never finish high school. So at that point, our question was, well, what's going on? How, how is our presence here in the campus ministry that is located in this neighborhood and being also presence in the community through churches, through neighborhood organizations is connected? What's going on? So what seems to be the problem then with the statement of that 12-year-old of that, um, girl? Well, the problem is that many, many programs at the time and still many do today uh, separate these young people by the teaching of abstract dogma, by the teaching of this systematic theology from the social reality of the neighborhoods. Many of these young people in their communities experience racial profiling, uh, racial profiling, they experience violence by, by racist police, domestic violence, and many other systemic barriers uh, so prevalent in Canada. So by not being able to reflect theologically about their social structures, they were missing the opportunity to to get out of that context and and be and have the agency that allowed them to to move away from that. So as a ministry, we decided to listen to the real theologians, the real theologians of the programs who were these young people reflecting on their own experiences. So we began taking our our life outside of the university walls because we began to see the transformation of our neighborhood as in integral to a gospel that represents and transmits the memory of Jesus, who, by the way, identify with these young people, with the people who, who were being um, oppressed in these communities. So that was the paradigm shift, not only for myself, but for our, for our community. Our campus ministry began to be a community that integrated social initiative, leadership development, and integral mission toward the transformation of our campus and our community. And it is a challenge because we don't necessarily know how to do it, but by being present, we're trying to change that dynamic. And lastly, as I conclude, I'm telling you that as we realized that the social, that, that this gospel uh, that we were proclaiming has social consequences and has social consequences and transformation and the transformation of our communities. But at the same time, it is by being present and working toward the transformation of our communities that God became uh, visible to these people. A God that, by the way, became human and moved into the neighborhood. So maybe I can tell you a bit more of my story later. That's a bit of my my shift. Beautiful. Thank you, Sebastian. And at this time, we're going to welcome all our uh, storytellers. So stay here, Sebastian, and come on back, uh, Sparrow and Kurt. And we also want to invite Rachel, uh, who's coming back with us. Again, uh, if you haven't already, please put some of those questions uh, in the uh, stage Q&A area. Uh, so we're going to have a little time to um, bat around some ideas and thoughts uh, with all of us. And the first question is comes from an elder in a church who says, you've communicated the missional challenge. If my local congregation wants to respond, where do we start? What do I tell them? This is for anyone if you want to jump in. <laughs> the first thing that came to mind when when I saw that question um, was was thinking, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. Um, I think that there's just so much anxiety about keeping kids entertained, keeping kids within the walls, um, uh, making sure that they're spiritually fed and uh, and, and I think if we seek first the kingdom of God, all these other things will be added unto you. And we're just reversing them. We're, we're getting them backwards. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. I agree with Kurt. And, and also, I think maybe it's just finding what's already there. So, for example, my like lens is young adults because that's who I work with. But a lot of the young adults I know are involved in something in their communities already, but they can't get the local church on board. So maybe as a church posture, it's just like 
surveying what's what's out there, what's already going on that we just need to join instead of thinking like we have to start a new program and start a new thing. It's very likely that there's already people from the church and definitely from the community who are already, already engaging some of these more difficult spaces. Yeah, uh, someone asked something about how might we as uh, ad adults, maybe not young adults, but older adults uh, intentionally displace ourselves in order to make place for young adults and maybe by extension, the more marginalized in community. I can jump in again. Um, I, I think we have to rethink what our role is and um, too often, I think that we think that we're empowering young people by getting them to follow along with whatever predetermined program that we already have. And it has to be the other way around. We need to follow our kids. And I think we need to understand ourselves as facilitators and conveners, uh, not as leaders and entrepreneurs. They're the entrepreneurs. They're the ones that, that we need to follow. Absolutely. It sounds like uh, like Sebastian, we need to listen to the 12 year olds, right? Um, so here's a question. Jesus laid out for the two disciples everything that is in the scriptures, Old Testament, uh, and then everything that was said. What does what does this mean? Everything that was said about Jesus? What does this mean for our use of scripture in our role as caminantes in our different contexts? Yeah. Personally, I would say we have to continue to be completely immersed and versed ourselves, but I think we've done a lot more work on understanding scripture than we have on understanding our local context. And so then the, how does this apply? How does this actually bring light into our contextual realities is the part that we're not doing very well because we're reading scripture really deeply, but pretty disconnected from, from where we are. And so I think if we're doing the reading of our local context and the reading of scripture both equally deeply, then I think it's pretty natural how you start to see how one overlaps with the other. And I don't think it has to be programmatic or too thought out. It just comes out of us because we're people immersed in the scripture, but also immersed in where we are. So I don't know if I have like a recipe, but I just think we need to dig a little bit deeper into both. Nice. And another question. And, you know, I, I start to um, dream about the context that, that you're in, in Guatemala and Kansas City and, and urban Toronto and, and, and Seattle. Uh, what about those folks of us who are in the burbs? How do we hear this stuff? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think what comes up in me as you ask that is just, again, um, a holy reminder that no matter where you live and no matter what your context is, we all long for the same things, right? Like we all long for the same things. We are all like Goldie, who I shared about in my story, trying to find a sense of orientation. We all have our rituals. We all have our things that are... Um, that are, are keeping us from, from our own shame and the ways that we aren't connected to others and to God. And so I really encourage you to not distance yourself from Goldie's story, but really enter more fully into it when you're in, like in the suburbs, is to say that, um, yeah, yeah, ask yourself, what, what are the rituals and the sense of orientation in your own life? And then how do you continue to move towards others? And also how do you find those places and those people? Just lead, follow your own need to your neighbor and then that will help direct you. But there is need everywhere, my goodness, my goodness. It's just that people that are housed in the suburbs, they have the privilege of hiding um, more than my friends who sleep outside. So the same. So good. And, and there was a good reminder yesterday from David Fitch as well, that, that if COVID has shown us nothing else, there's lonely, hurting people everywhere. So great, great reminder. Sebastian, were you about to unmute yourself and say something? Maybe not at that particular moment. Uh, 
Sure. I mean, to just, just, I was just going to add, I mean, it, it connects with all the other question is that, um, again, all, all theology is contextual. Uh, the idea that, uh, you know, there's such a thing as an abstract, um, way of understanding the scripture, um, is, is, it's just, it just doesn't, doesn't work that way. Uh, and by understanding our own context, by understanding scripture within our own context is the way we understand where we are, where we're located. And just being present, really, uh, it means whatever, even if it is a suburb, if it is in the middle of downtown, uh, the idea is to be present and in, 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 in be community. And, and that's how you listen, really, to the necessities of other people. Like Often we come with pre uh prearranged plans we we create these plans from scratch and write what we're going to do strategies when we don't even know uh what are the challenges and needs of the community so just be there and listen mm. absolutely and that contextualization is definitely our our prayer in this conference right so if you haven't made fun of me already for how i say commonantes i'm going to try this question so i heard uh no he camino does that mean the disciples just walk with Jesus and day by day go where he leads? Yeah, I mean, I think ideally, yes. Um, the, you know, so caminante no hay camino means like walker or journeyer. There's, there's no like clear path forward and you, you make it as you go. And so I think that the reason I brought it up is just that there's so much uncertainty and there's not, I think, especially from our kind of North American pro programmatic kind of lens, we think like to do something, to be missional or whatever, it has to be like a program. It has to be structured. We have to know where we're going. Um, and I believe in strategy. You can ask the regional team I work on. I'm like always, saying like let's talk about strategy so it's not it's not that but it's a posture right of, of um, to kind of link into maybe another question that was in there like just acknowledging that we don't have all the answers acknowledging that as people of the way we we are just committing to walk alongside Jesus and that that we don't know where that's gonna take us and it's it's a lot more scary but it's also it's a lot more freeing I think Absolutely. Yeah, I hear that in, in all of your uh, presentations is this acknowledgement of our weakness <laughs> and ignorance and that there's power in that. Who knew? I think the Apostle Paul said something about that. Any other comments on, on that? Going in not knowing or going in curious? Yeah, I'm seeing James Padilla DeBoer's question there of, of starting in that position of weakness and ignorance. I just keep thinking of Jesus' instruction to the disciples sending them out saying, take no bag for the for the journey and going with nothing. And I think too often, uh, yeah, I scared some of you with with uh, my four step plan there. And, and I think that we too often buy into that. We buy into all of these other stories that we hear other people doing. And we need to go from that sense of nothingness that we have no idea where we're going. We have no idea where these questions are going to, to lead us, but we follow it. That's awesome. The, the paradigm shift is, is a surprise, right? It's, it's God at work in ways that we don't expect. Um, so uh, I have a question for Sparrow in particular, the importance of, what's the importance of storytelling in how you engage neighbors in your context? Hmm. What a great question. Yeah, I'm going to assume that you're that you're asking what's the importance in storytelling, um, like in places like this, um, in these particular contexts. Um, oh God, it's so it's so important. Um, I think you know um, we tend to see things so. Um, objectively and it we need to follow the way of Jesus and really make um, make things more subjective and um, a way to do that is by storytelling um, we all come to um, our own particular places out of our own out of our own stories and um, and so we have these presets um, ideas of what what everyone is highlighting right here about what we should bring to particular communities when the fact is it's the people among us that are the experts. Each individual person 
has their own story and we can't just take and um, and uh, take a prescribed model of care from Guatemala to Seattle to Kansas City to we, we have we have to listen to the stories among us in our particular ecosystems to know what is already there and then midwife midwife and till and um, encourage that fullness. So, so telling stories is so important, so important. And I echo what Rachel was saying, like, I am fully able to sit down and talk about how to do all these things on a, you know, like programmatic level. But what's most important is that like a mother to her child, people don't know within your midst that there are all these things set out in place um that provide boundaries it's the story within those boundaries that we should become interfaced with and be playing with so awesome yes jesus is weaving these uh stories in our various contexts and hopefully in the context of all of those who are gathered here as well so there are so many good questions that are flying by so so much good stuff that we haven't had the chance to talk about. So I do want to encourage everyone uh, in the conference, do follow up, do further reading, uh, contact, resource information, uh, a lot of that stuff, so that you can live into this more in your context. But I want to invite each of our speakers here to close us off with a summary statement, uh, a finishing statement of, of sorts, just a kind of hey, just remember this kind of thing, or else a question that we can take as we go to our table conversations in a few moments. Let each of you chime in, and maybe we can start with you, Rachel. Yeah, sure. So I'm going to try to weave my uh, response into one of the questions that I saw there about building a community of people that are curi curious, right? Community of curiosity. And so that was actually going to be kind of what I wanted to share um, as I was thinking about what to share in this last minute. Anyway, and I think, yeah, so I think the biggest thing is that curiosity is the antidote to fear. And and so I think a lot of times what we're afraid of is looking stupid, <laughs> using the long, wrong language. And so that's where I, I love the fact that like the, the, the disciples asked Jesus again a really stupid question, a foolish question. Um, and 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 Jesus was OK with that. And 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 came back with a response they were not expecting. And so I think, um, first of all, it's just like, it's really hard, but but like we have to do that work of being able to of ask those questions, even if we don't have the language, even if we look, we feel like we might look stupid, um, just being open to that. And so then how do you, how do you do that when there's a lot of, a lot of barriers to that in a community. I think you just start by modeling. I think you just start maybe where it's again with the Judea idea, like where it's slightly more comfortable. So um, I would love it if <laughs> churches finally ask the young adults that I know that are leaving, like ask them about it with open-ended questions. And, and that shouldn't be that hard. These are children that grew up in the church. So, so maybe it's just starting in that place where it's like slightly less comfortable. And then the, the discomfort, you know, you get more used to it. And I don't know if you ever get uncomfortable, but you just get used to being in that space. And so um, maybe by the end of the day, you can be hanging out with some of Sparrow's friends <laughs> and, and you wouldn't have expected it, but maybe just start with the people that are just slightly uncomfortable and, and modeling it in the church. Um, we need people who can model that, that attention to the people that the church is starting to, to move away from. So thank you. Thanks. And Sebastian, can I put you on the spot? Yes. Uh, but I was going to say, uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, but I was, I was going to say that um, I think, as, 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 as you heard through all the speakers uh, and, and, and from these experiences, our, our responsibility as, as Christian leaders or, or as people who are trying to transmit uh, the message of Jesus and, and create a shalom in our communities, our responsibility is to recognize really that the message contained in the Bible, in the scriptures, relate, related, originally related directly to these concrete communities of God's people to which it was directed. And by that, I mean that we need to understand that uh, these theological doctrines and concepts that we that we encounter and and, and tell others 
are um, are concepts that came in the scriptures originally after the authors of the text struggle in the daily life of these communities like we're part of 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 the struggles of the conflicts of the suffering and joys of of their own particular communities and in the same way we cannot detach that message uh from the from the text and assume that those are abstract knowledge that that applies to every single context we need to as the authors of the scriptures struggle with our own communities struggle with our own context understand their joys and their happiness in order to apply that message of the gospel to that so i think it's it, it sounds um complicated but it's, it's nothing really more than just being there and loving each other which is complicated in itself but, but i think we should start by that awesome hear that call to contextualize kurt yeah um i think one of the things that that is helpful to know in all of this is um you know uh, the kids that, that we had do this are not a team kids. You know, these are literally the kids who are on my street who had nothing better to do with their summer. They're the kids of undocumented parents, um, refugees, DACA recipients. They were just regular kids who asked them questions about how creation was, how creation was groaning for liberation all around them. Um, so if you want to go and do anything likewise with what you've heard from me or anyone else today, it's ask those kinds of questions and follow them down that rabbit hole to see how deep it goes. Awesome. Thanks. And Sparrow, I'll let you finish us. Mm. Oh, man. Um, yeah, I really can't emphasize enough the practice of prayer and honing in um, your communion with the Holy Spirit. Um, I beg you and ask you to watch the mothers, the women around you, how they go about the earth and their care for others. I beg you and I ask you to read the stories of Black women who have had no other choice but to create imaginative, creative models of care in their own communities because they need it. Um, and I guess I'll leave you with this one thing as a practice in the morning that helps me. To be attentive to that and to be guided by the golden thread of the Holy Spirit throughout the day and embodying this in your own communities. I ask you to wake up in the morning, close your eyes, and listen for the first bird song. And I want you to look out the window and see if you can find that bird. This is a way of just really ridding yourself and kind of growing in this inattentive blindness. We wake up and we want to get going. We want to take out our computer. We want to do this, that, and the other. But the fact is, is that we are a part of such a beautiful story. And to really to really try to quiet the noise, to hear the, the Holy Spirit and to greet the particularity of each person is to find that bird song in the morning. So bless you as you do that. Thank you. Thank you all so much for these beautiful stories of, of God at work and these words of, of encouragement and challenge. I'm gonna look for people poking their heads outside their door tomorrow morning and uh, looking for, for birds. This is fantastic. I know if we were live and in person, the 300 people or so would be clapping uproariously. So at this time, we are going to move to our cable conversations. Even if you didn't make it yesterday, we really encourage you, hey, dig into this opportunity, even if you didn't make it to your table, even if you tried, try again, because uh, this will be good. If you've joined us uh, just today, again, it's on the left of your screen, so that's this way. Uh, you have the sessions tab. And once you click on that sessions tab, you're gonna leave this area, the stage, and you'll have several options. And there you'll just go and look for and find the table number or group name. Uh, for those of you who were here yesterday, it's the same table number, same group name. If you're unable to locate your group, your table, go ahead and in the event part on the right side of your screen, uh, click on uh, event chat and uh, put in there that you're having trouble and we'll get somebody to you as quick as we can to assist you. That's right. Rich and I are trying to keep our left and right uh, 
according to the screen here. Now, for if for some reason any of you experience any sound or video issues at your table, we want to encourage you to first try and refresh your screen. Uh, if you're still having trouble after that, please reach out to us via the event chat. Now, during the break at 12 p.m. Eastern time, where I'm at, there will be lunch and coffee tables open for you, and you'll get more instructions from your table facilitators. And then after the break, we'll be back right here on the stage for our next plenary session, which will kick off at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. But please do come back, try and come back about five minutes earlier so that we'll be ready to go. So once again, click on those sessions tab, pick your table number or find your group name, enjoy this half hour at the tables and your table hosts will be there to guide you. And we will see you soon. <laughs>